In essence, it's giving yourself away to whatever God wants. Acknowledging that he is king, that he is sovereign, and completely surrendering and saying that he is Lord of lords. Amen? So this next song we're going to sing, I give myself away. And even in this moment, if there's anything we're holding on to that doesn't necessarily please God or anything that we put above him or ahead of him, let's lay it down at his feet right now. See, God, I give myself away. I don't surrender to God right now. I give myself. I give myself away so you can use me. Take my heart. Take my life. Take my life. That's a living sacrifice. As I live inside All my dreams. I 
give myself, I give myself to you. When I'm gone with my 
one. I just want you and nothing else. Nothing else. Nothing else. Nothing else. Talk to him about this morning. Talk to him about whatever the situation is. He's a guy who's one on one with us. Hallelujah. And not only is he able, but he is a willing guy. He's able and willing. Hallelujah. We know some people who might be willing, but they may not be able, right? Some people might be able, but not willing. But God is able and willing. Hallelujah. God wants to move on his children's behalf. So God, show up and do something new right now, God.
Hallelujah. God, nothing else matters, God, when you're, when you're here with us, God. God, draw us close in this moment. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. All right, let's say hello to our brothers and sisters and your new faces. Get to know their names. Say hello and good morning. Good morning, everybody. I'm so thankful that everybody's here today. Um, it was a beautiful Sunday despite the rain overnight. I'm hoping it's kind of cooling it down for outside. But, you know, I just want to say if it's your first time joining us here at Hope Church Midway, we just want to welcome you. And if you could do us a favor of filling out uh, what we call a connect card, it's in the seat back in front of you. And if you could drop that off at the Welcome Center before you exit, we would so appreciate that. We have a little special gift with you or for you, and it's just to be able to. Um, connect with you further at a different time. All right, so we do have several ways to give at Hope Church Midway. You can give online. There's a QR code in the seat back in front of you, as well as through the Uversion link. There's a giving link within there. And then we also have our give boxes that are, as you exit downstairs, um, you'll notice that you can get an envelope and um, fill out your information, be able to drop off your offering through there. But let's close our eyes and bow our heads. Lord God, we thank you for today that we can celebrate how you bring us from spiritually dead to spiritually alive. We praise you for that, and we're just so excited to be able to celebrate with others, Lord God. And we pray that just that you would be with our financial offering, Lord, that the finances given would be able to just give us more opportunity to be able to share your love out in the community and around the world, and that you would just be able to do even more than we could ever imagine. We love you so much, and we give this offering to you freely. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. We also want to let you guys know that we do have prayer that we do throughout the week for the prayer needs, and so there's also some cards in the seat backs in front of you where you can fill out any of your prayer requests or your prayer needs. Um, and then um, you can drop those off as the give boxes as you exit. And then on Monday nights, we're partnering with the community, too, at 7 p.m., where we're uh, participating in prayer in the park. And this is just a great time for us to be able to pray for a solid hour just about the needs of this community, pray for the individuals that are there. And we hope to partner with multiple churches. And so we just pray that, you know, if you guys have never been there, that you would join us in that and join us at 7 p.m. tomorrow. Um, we also want to let you guys know that we have midweek going on to Wednesday nights at 7 p.m. And in terms of just the way that we love on the community, we have several outreaches that we've been participating in. So I just want to thank the volunteers who helped us at the car show that happened this past Friday night. It was so awesome. Like, it was the first time they closed down officially part of Archer. And there was just a lot of people there. It was just a really good time passing out fun things and just sharing a little bit about the church. And we have another opportunity to do that um, this coming Thursday, which is the Patriots Day Parade. And so with that, we're going to be walking in the parade and just being able to toss some candy, invite some individuals to the church and stuff like that, and share some cards and stuff where they can get information about the church. And so if you've never walked with us in the parade, we would love for you to join us. Um, there's a sign-up sheet that should be on the back table so that we have an idea of when you're, if you're going to be joining us. And actually, we're going to be meeting at the church at 530 so we can decorate the vehicle and then go to the location um, where we're starting the parade. It's just going to be a really good time. And so if you haven't joined us before, I suggest that you join us this Friday or this Thursday um, and sign up at the back. Um, we also want to let you guys know that there is also the ladies' paint party that's happening this coming Saturday afternoon. So if the ladies haven't signed up for that, it's an awesome event. Melissa Tomaseki is hosting with her new business, Mama's World. And so it's a free event. And so we want to have an idea of the ladies that are going to be able to join us. So sign up there, and we would love to have you with us. 
And that's all I have. I'm telling you, she loves it, loves it, loves it when you do that. It does not embarrass her at all. <laughs> Good to see everyone here. If I have not met you yet, my, if I have not met you yet, my name is JJ. I'm the pastor here. It's a pleasure to have you here uh, at Hope Church Midway. If you have not gotten communion yet, feel free to grab it on that back table. Feel free. You can go right now. Don't worry, don't worry about it. It's perfectly fine. You can get up and grab it. Uh, but I'll be on the back table. Feel free to grab that. We're going to do that at the end of the service. I want to encourage you, we're starting a new midweek series this Wednesday at 7 p.m., going over the book of Revelation. Uh, so I know a lot of people have a lot of different uh, questions about the book of Revelation, so we're going to be going over that uh, starting this Wednesday. So if you'd like to check that out, that'll be at 7 p.m. It's going to be an awesome uh, conversation and discussion. So I want you to see that. And we're excited to uh, celebrate with those who are getting baptized today. Um, so what we do with baptism here, that's a good thing. What we do with baptism here, baptism it does not save you, you know, the Bible clearly says what actually saves you is you're saying that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that he was raised from the dead. That is what saves us according to the Bible in Romans 10, 9. Baptism just shows what hap happened on the, out uh, shows on the outside what's already been happening on the inside. So when they're saying that Jesus is Lord, you might say, well, what does that mean, that, that phrase, Jesus is Lord? Well, uh, simply put, he guides, we follow. Does that sound pretty simple enough? He guides, we follow. It's a nice way of just seeing of what it means for him to be Lord. And, and again, this isn't just about information. It's about transformation. If he's going to be leading us, we don't just say, well, God's wanting me to go this way. That's some good information. You actually go that way. There you go. I mean, I know, I know this is really hard theological stuff we're talking about today. All right? But, I mean, it's just that simple, all right? He tells you just to go. We say, okay, I'm going to follow. And, and that's what it means for him to be Lord. Because our default nature is to do one of two things. is to focus inward, focus on ourselves, right? And what we're going through, our issues, our problems, our thoughts. Or to focus horizontally, what's right in front of us, things that we're dealing with, issues we're dealing with. It's an easy thing for us to deal with and, and to have that default nature. But saying that Jesus is Lord is saying we're going to shift our focus to vertical, and be focusing on Jesus. And what does this kind of look like? Uh, well, it's kind of like when you first learned how to drive. And hopefully, I mean, I've seen some of y'all drive. But, um, but when you first learn how to drive, you know, one of the things that you see is if you start looking at some place, what happens to you? If you start looking in that direction, you start driving that direction, right? You know, if you're worried about a car and they're like, okay, don't worry about that car. Stay focused ahead. You're like, what car? That car? That car? That car? And you don't realize that you're starting to veer towards it because that's what your focus is. And even though you're supposed to focus straight ahead on the road, you start veering that way because that's our default nature. Without you even realizing it, you start to go that way. Some of you have now learned how to drive. All right. Uh, <laughs> the other thing that we see is if our focus is, is, that's what happens if our focus is horizontally in the wrong place. If our focus is inwardly, if you're on your phone, <clears throat> you know, texting or something, well, that could be a very, pretty big issue, right? That could be an accident very easily if we're focusing on inwardly. So it's important for us to realize our focus can either help us or it can hurt us. It help us or it can hurt us. It help us get to where, where we need to go or it can hurt us by crashing into something or into someone. And that's the same kind of thing that what Jesus did. But Jesus came to help us to shift our focus, to, fo to shift that focus from going inwardly or just horizontally to focus vertically, to see what God has for us. And that's a great thing that we see. Because first of all, we messed up on that relationship from the very beginning. We look at Adam and Eve, and when they first messed up, what were they doing? They were focusing inwardly. I want to call the shots. I want to be Lord of my life. I want to say what I want to do. That was that inward focus. Then they focused uh, horizontally. All right, well, this looks good for me. This, this looks like this would be a fine thing. I know what God said, but I'm going to forget what's being said to me vertically, and I'm just going to focus on what's being said in front of me. Make sense? And so that was the fall that they had. Now, how many of you know we can blame Adam and Eve, but we can see that we do the same thing, right? We focus inwardly, we focus horizontally, and we, a lot of times we try to ignore it vertically, right? We try to do that. But it's important for us to see that we're able to come and have a relationship with God, so we can have that vertical relationship. That's the reason Jesus came, died, and rose, was so we could have that relationship. That relationship could be restored, and that is a beautiful thing. I mean, it's what we celebrate in Christmas, Jesus coming for that 
um, I, for that relationship. So we celebrate in Easter, him dying so we could have that relationship. And today we're going to be focusing on a prayer that he says right before he dies. We're going to look at the Lord's Prayer. Now, when we think of the Lord's Prayer, I know where a lot of our minds go. We think our, our Father, and, you know, we think of that because it's called the Lord's Prayer. But that was just a prayer that Jesus said, this is an idea of how to pray. The actual prayer that Jesus said is actually found in John 17, when he actually prayed for humanity before he went to the cross. So if you want to turn to your Bibles, John 17, you can look on your phones, turn your Bibles, look up here. I always say it's a great thing to follow along and look at it later for yourself. It's a good thing. So this is what Jesus' prayer for us before he went to the cross, that we would focus on the fullness of a relationship with God. Starting in verse 1, Jesus looked up to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son so he can give glory back to you. For you have given him authority over everyone. He gives eternal life to each one you have given him, and this is a way to have eternal life, to know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ the one you sent to earth. So what is the main thing that Jesus is praying here, that we would shift our focus and that we would know God? He said, this is eternal life. When we, people think about eternal life, we think about heaven. People might think of streets of gold. They think of just going on forever. They might think of th seeing their loved ones. But he's saying, no, the eternal life you're actually looking for, the relationship you're looking for is this, to know God. That is eternal life. Because all we're saying is I'm going to be looking at seeing loved ones or I'm going to be living forever. We are missing the point of living forever with God, which is knowing God, seeing him fully for the rest of existence. And that's an amazing thing. And so he's saying this is that idea that we could have that vertical focus the entire time. How do we do that? Well, he says, I'm praying that you would glorify. So what does he mean? Jesus is saying, let the people see Jesus on earth as he is in heaven so that people would understand God in heaven. So an easier way of breaking that down is if we focus on Jesus, we will find God. Amen. If we focus on Jesus, we will find God. And this is exactly what he's saying. He's saying, I'm wanting them to be able to focus in and see you when they think of me. Because a lot of times, that's not what we think about. We don't think about Jesus when we think about God. We kind of miss some things. I mean, how do most people see God? A lot of people see God as just some big judge that's sitting up in heaven you know, and it's just saying, okay, you did this right or you did this wrong, and that's kind of how they see God, or they see him just as somebody who's mad all the time, you screwed up again, I can't believe this, you know, and they, they have that thought process about God, or maybe they see God as so far away and distant from us, and that we can't connect with him, and you know, he's up in heaven, we're here on earth, and hopefully he's hearing what's going on, hopefully he knows, and a lot of times we'll think about that, but Jesus' prayer was that we would actually understand who God is, and have that focus so that we would have that vertical relationship. See, the reason that we have that kind of view, and a lot of people see God in those ways, is because our view is incomplete, because we haven't looked at the scriptures in the Old Testament that describe God. So we've missed it. The best description you hear out throughout the Bible, we see this in Psalm 103, but we see this throughout the Old Testament. Psalm 103, verse 8. The Lord is compassionate and merciful, slow to get angry, and filled with unfailing love. That phrase you see constantly throughout the Old Testament. It's how God describes himself. It's how other people describe himself. But I like Psalm 103 because it explains, it expands on this a little bit more of this great love that he has. And he says this, he will not constantly accuse us or remain angry forever. How many people need to know that about God today, right? He's not going to be mad at you forever. He's not constantly looking and say, you screwed up again and again and again. That's not God. That's the enemy. If you're feeling that, that's, that God's always saying, I can't believe you messed up again, I can't believe you messed up again, that is from the pit of hell. That is not God. It's important to know that. He does not punish us for all of our sins. He does not deal harshly, harshly with us as we deserve. That shows that mercy. We messed up, yet he paid the cost on the cross. It's a beautiful love that he has. For his unfailing love towards those who fear him is as great as the height of the heavens above the earth. He has removed our sins as far as the east is from the west. The Lord is like a father to his children, tender and compassionate to those who fear him. This is who God is. But people had this bad view of who God was, was even in Jesus' times. They saw him as, again, this judge or somebody who was mad or somebody that they had to appease and all these other things that Jesus was saying, no, no, allow them to see who I am so they can see who you are. Allow them to see that because when people think about this, yeah, all these things about compassionate and loving and everything, people think about that with Jesus, right? 
We think about that with Jesus. Jesus is loving, that's awesome. But then when we think of God just as the fullness of him, we're like, ugh, I just see that man in the sky who's just mad. But Jesus wanted us to understand who God is. His prayer was that we would find God by focusing on him. Because when we focus on who Jesus is, we'll see who God is. Because we will not follow if we don't see who God is fully. We're not going to follow him if we don't trust him. And we're not going to trust him if we don't find reasons to love him. It's important for us to know. If, if we don't have that love, that trust is not going to happen. We're not going to follow. All of those things flow together. You know, it's important for us to say, God, I know that you actually love me. One, one of the things that I, I used to do with my friends when I was dating, this was many years ago, uh, when I was dating, they'd always say, hey, man, what's a good line to start to talk to a girl to see, you know, she's talking. I'm like, the line is you see if they, first of all, even are interested in you. That's the line, all right? <laughs> And like if you're walking around, you look and you smile at them, they smile back, they're somewhat interested, or they're just nice. And then you go over to them and just say, hi, my name is JJ, and like, oh, hi, my name, blah, blah, blah. That's your line. You're all making it too complicated, okay? And I said, that's it. And a lot of times we think that with God. Well, okay, I got to show that I'm so sorry. I got to get some tears going, so I'm going to poke my eyes and really show that I'm really sorry for the sins that I've done, and I'm going to go to church for about three months straight and then say, okay, look at what I've done. I'm going to read the Bible every day. No, no, no. He is tender and compassionate. He already showed his love on the cross. You got more than a smile. He showed his love ultimately for you. He already is saying, hey, I've done everything in this relationship. I want you to have this relationship with me. Look up to me. Allow me to show you what I have for you. That's a beautiful thing for us to see of what Jesus has done. But again, that's how we find that love. Then we can find that trust and we can start to follow. We also see in John 17, it says that Jesus has authority. What does it mean that Jesus has authority? Again, he leads, we follow. He leads, we follow. We don't just say, okay, Jesus, you're my Lord. I'm going to follow you. So as I'm going this direction, you should go this direction too. That's not what that means. It's saying, okay, if you're asking me to change direction, I have to be okay with that. That's hard. That's hard for anybody. And if you don't think it's hard, you've never done it. It's hard because, again, our default nature is to look inside and to look horizontal. Okay, this is what I'm feeling in this situation. This is what I'm seeing in front of me. But then this is what God's saying. And it's seeming to be different than what I'm seeing and what I'm feeling. But I still have to trust that I can follow him. That's hard to do. But it's worth it. It's worth it. When we have to ask, what normally has our attention? It's kind of like with driving, like we were talking about earlier. What has our attention determines our direction. If everything is internally, what's going to happen? Well, I'm going to rely on my own experiences, my limited wisdom. You know, I mean, every one of us, if we were to ask ourselves 10 years ago, we thought we were really smart. And then 10 years from now, we're like, oh, wow, there's a lot of things I didn't know 10 years ago, right? And guess what? In 10 years from now, you're going to think, oh, wow, I was really smart now, and I'm much smarter later. All right? Why? Because we're learning more. But if we're just going off our own experience and our own emotions, your emotions are going to cause you to go in the wrong directions at times. So you can't just look... Uh, if we can't just look inwards, we have to say, okay, I can't just look horizontal because if all I'm doing is focusing on the problems in front of me, I'm going to go insane. I'm going to go crazy if I'm just focusing on the problems in front of me. Why? Because you have no control over those things. You have no power over those things. If you're really honest about it, you can't change these things. So we have to say, well, I can look vertical. Am I going to focus on the one who can help, who cares, and who wants to guide us? I mean, think about what happens when we go to a town that we've never been to before, and we want to navigate ourselves around. What do we do? What do we hit on? What do we use? GPS. Don't act like y'all don't do that. (laughs) I use GPS in Chicago. Come on. If you're going to a place you've never been to, you're using GPS, right? All right. So, I mean, this is is something that we do. We use GPS because we're like, look, I don't know where I'm going. Your emotions aren't going to guide you in a place you've never been. You know, what you see in front of you is not necessarily going to help you if you're trying to get to a different direction. That's not going to help you. You need something else outside of you. So we look vertical to some satellites to help us to guide us. It's sad that we trust Google a lot more than we trust God. Because that's the truth. Because when it comes to trusting God, no, no, what I feel or what I see, that's what I'm going to go on. I'm not going to go on anything else that's going to be guiding me. It's hard. I mean, we're quick to turn on GPS, but we're slow to pray and to wait and say, God, where are you wanting me to go? Where are you wanting me to go? It's a hard thing. But Jesus is praying that we'd see the reasons to trust and the reasons to follow because he doesn't want us to get lost anymore. He's tired of seeing us get lost. 
going down dead-end roads, going to the same place again and again. He's like, look, I want better for you. So this is Jesus' prayer before he goes to the cross. Allow them to see you as they, when they see me so they can actually have this relationship. They can trust and follow. He's asking that for us. That is his prayer for you and for me. Because we must know that Jesus did not go to the cross for nothing. He went for you and for me. Verse 4 says this. I brought glory to you here on earth by completing the work you gave me to do. Now, Father, bring me into the glory we shared before the world began. See, Jesus came and helped people to see who God really is. And Jesus wants us to see what his sacrifice means for us. You know, when we think about Jesus died for the whole world, that can seem very generic. It can seem very impersonal. Oh, yeah, yeah, he died for everybody in this room because that's just what he did. That was the plan. So he, he died for everyone. And we miss that he's saying, no, no, this is a personal thing. He died for you and for me. We have to make it personal to understand what Jesus is actually praying, what he's actually focusing on here, saying, I'm completing this work so that no one would be lost. See, Jesus' will, as we read in Peter, and Peter writes this, and he says that his will, God's will is that no one would be lost. That's God's will. When he went on the cross, he's saying, I'm dying so that no one has to be apart from me, that everyone could have that relationship, regardless of your background, regardless of anything else. That's the good news. You know, it's amazing when, when they were going around, the disciples were first sharing about Jesus after he ascended and, and he, after he rose and he ascended, and then people were going around, they were sharing. They called it the good news because people were amazed to hear that Jesus came, died, and rose so we could come have a relationship with God. That was foreign in those worlds. In the worlds back in the days, you had to do all these sacrifices, you had to make all this noise, do all this other stuff to try to appease that God and hope that they would somehow focus on you because that God was so far away, you had to do all these other things to try to get that God's attention. And then they hear, no, Jesus came, died, and rose, so we can come have that relationship. He did the work. But how many times do we still treat God that same way? I got to do all these other things to show you that I can get you that attention. God doesn't want us to have to try to prove anything. Jesus did it all on the cross. And when he died, he died for all of our sins. Our sin and our shame is dead on the cross. There's so many times that Christians will come over and say, Jesus, I'm giving you my life. I believe that you are Lord and that you've saved me from my sins. I believe that you rose again. And we're so excited for these things, but then we still live our life as if we're stuck in sin. We know all those things that I did before, you know what, they're, I still am that person. No, that person died on the cross with Jesus. All those other things that defined me before, I'm still that individual. No, that stuff died on the cross with Jesus. We have to understand that. And we have to live in the freedom. It's crazy. We, we just celebrated Juneteenth when they went around and they were telling people that, hey, you're set free from slavery. There's a bunch of people that didn't know they were free already. That was the good news. They were sharing with everybody. You're free already. Jesus did it on the cross. Accept your freedom. It's the same thing. And how many people should be that excited? We should be just as excited as they were then saying, wow, I'm free. That's awesome. We should see the freedom that we have gotten from Jesus. Amen? Amen. And then he rose again. He rose again. Why did he rise? He rose to give us that power to actually live day to day. He gives the Holy Spirit to help us out every single day and to show that he is God. It's not just some other religion. It's not just some other book, but that he is God. It's important for us to see this. He wants us to see what this sacrifice means because when we do, we're going to love him, we're going to trust him, we're going to follow him. Amen? It's important for us to see this. Jesus is, in fact, praying for those who are following him. Let's look at verse 6. It says this, I have revealed you to the ones you gave me from this world. They were always yours. You gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything I have is a gift from you, for I have passed on to you the message you've given me. They accept it and know that I came from you, and they believe you have sent me. See, when we look to Jesus, he has us look to the good news. Now, I love how he puts it here. He says, look, um, he says, they were always yours. You gave them to me, and they have kept your word. So does that mean none of those disciples ever messed up? No, they messed up. Yeah, if you read the Bible, they've messed up. I mean, Peter, one time, Jesus had to say, get behind me, Satan, okay? They messed up. They made mistakes. But I love how Jesus looks at them. He's like, look, I'm not looking at your mistakes. I'm looking at myself on the cross and how I forgave you. We have to see. That's what Jesus sees. The people that are getting baptized here is not people who are going to say, I'm never going to make a mistake in my life again. No, but they're going to say, Jesus has helped me. When I've fallen down, he's going to pick me back up. 
And that's why we're so excited to have him be our Lord. Why? Because he's not saying, hey, you didn't listen to me. You went down the wrong road again. What's wrong with you, you idiot? <laughs> again, 103, doesn't treat us like our sins deserve. <laughs> Nobody looks at us and says, no, I care about you. Allow me to guide you to where you need to be. That's that loving care that he has. I love that. But what does he say? How does he help us to navigate us? He shows us that the Bible has all we need to navigate in this world. I love it. He points everybody back. He says, look, you've helped me to fulfill the word. I've given them the word, and this word is going to show them the fulfillment. Everything they need is in that word. It's important for us to know that we are not going to be able to navigate this thing on our own, but that God has helped us out. He's given us the steps that we need, the guidance that we need through his word. You might be here and say, you know what? I have a hard time understanding the Bible, and I understand that. Trust me. I get that. We always tell people, if you're just starting to read the Bible, start reading the book of Mark first. Mark was written for people who don't know the Old Testament. So you're okay. <laughs> That's a great place to start. Then I tell people to go to the book of James. James help, lets you know what Christians should be like, the ultimate goal of what we should be like. Then I tell them to read the book of Acts to show you what a church can be like. And that's an awesome thing. Then go through the Bible. After you got that great foundation. It's a great way of looking into it. And so, and you know, the other thing is you can go to Bible study and other things that we have to help you to understand how to read the Bible. It's important. Why? Because the Bible has all we need to navigate this world. If we're not using it, it's like having GPS and still just trying to drive around and wondering why you got lost. You know? And that's the same thing. God's like, I've given it to you. What do you want? Here you go. Let's utilize it. Amen? Because we look inwardly, we're only going to have our own limited wisdom. If we're looking horizontal, we're going to see other people's limited wisdom. But if we look vertical, we get God's unlimited wisdom. It doesn't mean he's going to reveal everything to us at one time. Sometimes we have to wait, we have to pause, and we have to trust. See, that's a problem. That's the difference between GPS and waiting on God. GPS, if it doesn't go happen right away, man, we have a problem, right? I remember I, I was taking my son to a, a doctor's appointment when we had the, uh, the eclipse, and my GPS didn't work. I was like, oh, no. <laughs> I'm so in trouble. And like this, I had to go like to the burbs and stuff. So I was like totally lost. And thank God it turned on in about two minutes. I was like, oh man, I was like really, really worried on that. But for those two minutes, I was panicking on my inside. I'm like, I don't know anything. I've forgotten everything. <laughs> I've been stuck on GPS too much. You know, but that's how we should be without the Bible. God, I don't know anything if I don't have your word right now. I'm lost without this. I need this. And, and then wait in that time. And I know Chicagoans, we hate to wait. I get it. I know that we hate to wait. I'm with you. We absolutely hate it, but you know what? It's better to wait and go the right direction than to go ahead and go in the wrong direction, right? So it's important. Take time to wait. Wait on what God has for us. Because when we wait on God with trust, it shows that he is Lord and that we're following him. Let's look at verse 9. My prayer is not for the world, but for those you have given me, because they belong to you. All who are mine belong to you, and you have given them to me, so they would bring me glory. It's important to see that Jesus isn't praying for every single person here, but just the people who are following him, that they would bring God glory. And you see this word a lot of times just saying, what is, what is this focus on glory? That word glory means weight. So when you look on and you think about scales back in the day, and you'd have scales that had things on either side, you know, you would see whatever weighed more was worth more. And that's how they looked at it. And so when we give God glory, we're saying, God, you're worth more than just my feelings right now when I'm looking inwardly. God, you're, you're worth more than just my focus right now when I'm looking horizontal at my problems. You're worth more than that. You're, you're, you're worth more than my anxieties. God, you're, you're worth more than my stress. God, you're, you're worth more than all these other things that are pulling down on me. When I actually look at you, you are far more valuable. So why wouldn't I focus on you than focus on everything that's so much less valuable? Why would I give my time, my treasure, my talents to things that are less valuable to the one who is greater? It's an important thing for us to look at. And so that's what he's praying, that we would show this. He's saying, look, I want them to bring the God's glory to other people, that other people would see the value of looking vertical. That was Jesus' prayer for you and me. And again, he's praying for followers, not believers. And I say, what, what's the difference between a follower and a believer? Well, if you believe and you don't follow, I'd argue you don't believe. And the reason I'm saying that, I mean, if I believe that gravity works, I'm not going to jump off a roof. If I believe it works, right? I'm going to follow and say, that is a law. I'm going to follow that in a very good way, okay? I'm going to show that I actually believe this by following this. 
You know, I'm going to show this in my life. And a lot of times people are saying, yes, I believe that Jesus is God. I believe that he created this world. I believe that he loves me. I believe he died on the cross. I believe he rose again. These things are great, and I'm going to live my own life however I want. Why? Because we're looking inwardly or looking horizontally. We didn't look vertically and actually follow God. See, the difference is the people that are getting baptized today, they're the ones who say, no, you are Lord, which means I'm wanting to look vertical. Does that mean they're going to be perfect every single time? No, I'm not perfect at every single time. No one in this room is perfect at every single time. We're all going to go inwardly. We're all going to look at horizontally at different times. But the idea is to say, God, every single day, help me look more and more vertically to you every single day. Allow me to see your glory versus everything else. See how great you are versus everything else. Help me to do that more and more so I can start to follow you more and more. See, followers get benefits that believers don't. There's a great reason to be a follower and not just a believer. I mean, think about what followers get that believers don't get. Because if you look around us right now, just outside these doors, a lot of people that will say they believe in God but aren't following God. And it's not for us to say, oh, man, how can these people not follow God? It's, us, it's up to us, to us to share the good news of who Jesus is. Because yeah. someone shared that with us. Because yeah. we weren't following God and someone had to share it with us. So we don't look at anybody else and like, oh, those horrible people. No, no, no. We were like, no, I was a horrible person and God saved me. Isn't that awesome? And guess what? He could do the same for you. And look at what followers get that believers don't. We get the Holy Spirit in our life. If nothing else, we get the fullness of God in our life. That is incredible. If it just stopped there, that would be more than enough. We also get forgiveness. We get hope. We get guidance. We get power. We get a relationship with God. These are all wonderful benefits that followers get that believers don't. Why? Because believers aren't following. They miss what God has for them. And God doesn't want us to miss what he has for us. I love as we continue on this prayer in John 17, Jesus shares other benefits of following. Verse 11, now I'm departing from the world. They are staying in this world, but I am coming to you. Holy Father, you have given me your name. Now protect them by the power of your name so they will be united just as we are. During my time here, I protected them by the power of the name you gave me. I guarded them so that none of them would be lost except the one headed for destruction, that being Judas, as the scriptures foretold. I mean, look at what Jesus is praying for here, the, the wonderful benefits of following. Jesus prays for protection, Unity, endurance. Isn't that an amazing thing that we get when we actually follow God? And it's important for those who are getting baptized to know. When you get baptized, guess what's going to happen afterwards? You're going to get spiritually attacked. Some of you guys are nodding your heads. Some of you guys are just giving me big eyes, okay? <laughs> How do we know this? Jesus got attacked after he got baptized. And if Jesus got attacked, guess what? You're going to get attacked. Why? Because you're saying, look, I'm following. What baptism does, now some people are saying, you know, we baptized people when they were a baby. That's awesome for your parents as far as the dedication. You had no knowledge of that. But the Bible actually talks about when we choose to get baptized, we're saying, I'm choosing to follow. And we do that as an adult. Or as we have a couple of kids that are getting baptized who are, know what they're doing, who know that they're following. And they're saying, look, I'm at this place. I'm making this decision. It's not about my parents. It's about me making that decision, which is what the Bible calls for us to do. Baptism does not save us. It just shows what happens on the, uh, shows on the outside what has happened already on the inside, as we already said. So why would you go through this if you know you're going to get attacked? It's called obedience. If we're saying we're going to follow God, the first thing Jesus says when we're trying to follow him is get baptized. So we're saying, okay, I'm not just believing you, I'm following you. The first thing he tells us, get baptized. It's the first thing. And so when we do that, we're saying, okay, great, I'm going to do this, I'm going to get baptized, I'm going to follow him. Well, guess what? When you start to follow, you now you become a threat. Now you become a threat. And the enemy's going to do everything he can to mess with you. It's amazing to me that some of the most profitable movies in Hollywood right now are all about, like, exorcism and demons and all this other kind of stuff. Right? Yeah. And those are the most profitable movies. But yet, in church, we talk about the enemy, everybody's like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but you all pay your money for it to see this stuff, right? <laughs> Which, A, don't mess with that. Right? That's demonic. It's a good, good thing not to mess with. And B, it's important to see, look, if the rest of the world is seeing that this is real, why isn't the church? I mean, it seems kind of ridiculous when you stop to think about it, right? And we have to realize we have a real enemy. And why is he an enemy of us? Because guess what? Satan messed up and he went to hell. We mess up, we can get forgiveness. How ticked off do you think he is? You wonder why he wants to attack us. 
So why in the world would people sign up to say, yes, I'm going to follow him, and then I'm going to get attacked? Why? Because Jesus prayer for you. His prayer, just as he prays here for you, he prays for your protection. He says, look, I know there's going to be an attack, but I'm going to pray that you'll be protected. And if Jesus is praying for you, guess what? You have his backing. And that's huge for you to know. He prays that we would come together and find unity. You're not supposed to go through these battles alone. Unfortunately, what we see a lot of times in churches is when people start having a battle, they start to separate themselves. They're like, look, nobody else needs to know, worry about this. Nobody else needs to take care of this. Everybody's got their own issues. And we isolate ourselves. That's exactly what the enemy would want you to do. But he prays for our unity, that we would come together. Then he prays for our endurance. Yes, these struggles are going to come. But guess what? We can fight through them. We continue to move together. We continue to pray together. We continue to guide together. And we see this beautiful victory that is ours as Jesus is praying for him. Because following isn't easy, but it's worth it. And I don't want us to miss as we close and Juet comes up. We've told the church before, the reason we had Juet come up is not we're trying to set mood music or anything else like that, but it's like the Oscars, you know that I'm finishing. <laughs> but the main focus is that you would focus on this last part. And we don't want you to miss what God has in this moment. We don't want you to miss this. I want you to miss the best benefit that Jesus talks about following Jesus. Verse 13. Now I am coming to you. I told them many things while I was with them in this world so that they would be filled with my joy. The value of looking vertical is found in joy. The value of looking vertical is found in joy. Why are we saying that? Because why would you want to be obedient saying, okay, I know I can get attacked. I know I can have all these other issues. Why can't I just, you know, slide right through? I could be a believer, right? I don't have to necessarily follow. I, I can just be a believer, you know, and that, that's fine. You know, I believe that Jesus came, died, and rose. That's cool. But I don't really have to follow. I don't have to have him as, as Lord. I don't need to make that next step because you know what? There's a battle that comes with that, and I, I want to deal with that. But after Jesus prays for his protection, this unity, and this endurance, he then says, yeah, but I want them not to miss the joy. So what does that look like when you're feeling attacked? Well, for those who were here for, for midweek, uh, we had someone who asked us in the middle of, of midweek, they said, hey, can you pray? And we said, sure, absolutely. And another person in the church, their, their sister had gone to the hospital. She was pregnant, and, uh, you know, they thought they were going to lose the baby, and we're also going to lose her at the same time. They weren't even allowing her mom in, because they were saying, look, this is, this is dangerous. And so we stopped everything, and we said, all right, let's pray. Let's pray. And the great thing is afterwards, they're still waiting on the phone calls, they're hearing how she's doing, if she was alive or dead or anything else like that. They're still waiting, but she found a peace. Why? Because there is a peace because there is joy. It's not, see, happiness is based on circumstances. Joy is found in Jesus. Joy is knowing that he's in control, saying, I can give these things over to him. And right now, we're continuing to pray, but she's doing well. She's stable. The baby is stable, you know, and we're praying that God would continue. We're praying that God would continue. Why? Because it's God. And we can have that vertical relationship with him. We can stop and we can pray, and all of heaven shuts up when people are praying. It says that our prayers are like incense. Like God's like, oh, man, that's so awesome. I get to hear from my kids. You're not bothering God when you're praying to him. It's about relationship. He wants us to look vertical because he wants to guide us. He's tired of us getting lost tired of us just looking inwardly at our own issues. He's tired of us just looking at our problems, allowing that to be our focus. He wants to look vertically so we can be guided in him. As we prepare for communion, the Bible says that before we take communion, that we need to make sure that we examine our hearts before we take communion. That's what the Bible says in uh, 1 Corinthians 11. It says, examine your hearts, because we're not supposed to take communion in unworthy manner is what it says. You might say, well, what is an unworthy manner? An unworthy manner is I'm taking communion because everybody else is taking communion. So what makes it a worthy matter? A worthy manner is saying I'm taking communion because I've chosen to follow Jesus. See, when we practice what we call open communion here at Hope Church Midway, which means you don't have to be a member of our church. All you have to say is, yeah, I'm following Jesus. That's all it is, because that's what we see in the Bible. 
So with every head bowed and every eye closed, I don't want us to take a step further before we give an opportunity for people to say, I want to make a decision to follow Jesus myself. And maybe you're here and you came because you want to support someone who's, gotten, who's getting baptized today. We chose to make that decision to follow Jesus. Maybe they're a family member, they're a friend, they're a co-worker. We're saying, I'm here supporting them. And that's an awesome thing. But the thing that's even greater than having your support is having you follow Jesus alongside them. That's a greater thing. And the good news is that Jesus came, died, and rose so we can come and have a relationship with God. That we could die from our sin and our shame and we could rise again totally new. We go from spiritually dead to spiritually alive in that moment that we say, Jesus, you're my Lord. I'm going to be looking vertical. I'm going to let you call the shots. I'm going to be following your direction. I'm going to be a follower. And we believe that in our heart that Jesus was raised from the dead. Again, if we believe fully, we will follow. If you're here today with every head bowed and every eye closed, we do that for a reason. We don't want you to do it because you feel you're being pressured. We want you to do it just because you want to impress somebody else that's around you. I'm the only one who's looking so we can just follow with you later. But if you're here today, you're saying, I don't want to just believe in God. I want to follow God. If you're here today and you're saying, I want to make that decision to follow him today, to make him Lord of my life. With every head bowed and every eye closed, I want you just to raise your hand right now. We want to pray with you. Let's see that hand. Anyone else? No. Let's see that hand. No. And maybe you're here. You're saying, I used to follow Jesus. I used to have that vertical relationship, but you know what? All my stuff now has just been inward or just horizontal. And I need to make that decision. Say, God, I want to look more vertical now. I'm sorry I've neglected that. I've allowed everything else to overtake me. But I want to make that decision to look vertical again. If that's you with nobody else looking around, I want you to raise your hand. God, we thank you for those who raise their hands. God, who are going from believers to followers. It's a beautiful miracle that's happening in this place. We're excited to see wonderful miracles happening in people's lives as they're being in the hospital and, and people are worried that they're going to die and then you come through in miraculous ways. We love those kinds of miracles. But the greatest miracle of all is for us going from spiritually dead to spiritually alive. It's the greatest miracle there is. God, we know that your word says all of heaven celebrates when people make that decision. To stop just looking inwardly, to stop just looking horizontally, but looking vertically, saying, Jesus, you are Lord. I know I'm confessing I've been following my own way. I've been Lord of my life, but I want you to be Lord of my life. Jesus, I believe that you came, you died, and you rose, and you're going to come again, and I'm excited to see it. God, I thank you so much that you did all the work, Jesus, on the cross. Guys, we're going to celebrate here in communion in just a second. You did all the work on the cross to allow us to have that relationship with you, free and open. I pray right now as we prepare to take communion, you allow those who raise their hands to say, look, all I did was just say that Jesus is Lord and that I believe he was raised from the dead. Is that enough? Yes, because Jesus did the work. Allow them to know the freedom they have right now. They don't have to go back to slavery. They don't have to go back to their old ways. But they can wait and rely on you. Help us as a church to guide them as well. To help them to see you. So that we'd be united together. We pray for the same things as you pray for. God, we pray for their protection. We, God, we pray for their unity. God, we pray for their endurance. God, that they would see the glory of who you are every single day that they would make that decision to continue to look vertical. Thank you so much for all that you're doing. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. We can stand today as we take communion. We have a little different communion cup, so for those who might be confused, <laughs> we try to make it easier for you all, so hopefully it's easier. Uh, but the bread's on the bottom. Feel free to get that. And uh, when we're done, there's some trash cans in the back. You can toss these out in the end. But right now, we want to look at what the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 11. 
And since as we're gathered, we're supposed to remember and recognize what this bread actually means. We don't just do this just because everybody else is doing this. We do this because of what Jesus did on the cross for us. But this represents his body that was broken for you. And as we said earlier, it's easy to get impersonal about it. But as we take communion, you have to say, God, thank you so much for what you did for me. The sacrifice you did for me. Why? Because Jesus said you were worth him dying for. There's nothing for us to feel ashamed of or to feel not worthy of. Jesus knew you were because he made you worthy. Jesus, right now, as we pray before we take the bread, we thank you so much for your sacrifice. God, that our sins can go on the cross. God, that our shame goes on the cross, that all those things are dead. I pray that you would encourage us not to look at those things again, not to go back to those things again, but to realize they are dead. You didn't go to the cross for nothing. Jesus, you pray that we realize the glory of what was happening on that cross as you were fulfilling it that plan that you had to save humanity, to allow us to have that vertical relationship. God, I pray as we take this representative of your body, God, remind us throughout the week, God, throughout our lives, God, you paid the cost, what the cross means, and that we don't have to go back. We thank you so much. Let's take this together. As we prepare to take the, the juice that's there, the Bible says that this is the new covenant in Jesus' blood. The old covenant, you had to really say, okay, I have to follow all these other rules, and, and hopefully I'll, I'll be okay if I'm following all these rules. The great thing is Jesus says, follow me. Follow me. He'll help us out. His blood cleanses us, allows us to follow him, allows us to have that relationship with him. So Jesus, we thank you. So think, think about what your blood means and that we take it with joy. Not thinking that everything's going to be easy. God, you prayed for these things that we needed. God, knowing that we need your protection, knowing that we would need the unity. God, knowing that we need endurance. But Jesus, you did all that. You allowed us to have all that by your blood on the cross. Freed us from our sins and allowed you, God, Holy Spirit, to live in us. And that's why we don't take this with sadness of your sacrifice, but we take it with joy, because as you said yourself, you on the cross look for joy even in the midst of the sorrow. Because you looked at the people here and said, I want that relationship with them. You found joy. May we find joy in that sacrifice as well. Thank you so much for what you're doing. Let's take this together. But allow those who are getting baptized to go ahead and head over. Everybody else just hang here for a little bit. I'm going to dismiss this in just a second. Uh, the men, if you can go to the youth room over there. Jen, if you can get Graciela's key. And ladies can go to the house right there uh, just to get ready. The rest of us are going to head over there in just a second. But before we go, so just a bit, that doesn't people. Everybody else just kind of hang for a second. Everybody else can just hang for a second. I want to encourage you, those of you who are not getting baptized, uh, but are here maybe to celebrate somebody who is getting baptized, or maybe just came here because like, hey, this is a Sunday and somebody invited me, I came. We have a great meal afterwards. You can take, take part of that, okay? We want you to hang out. We want to get to know you, all right? It's not just about having people come over here and sit in a chair. We like to know who people are. So hang out for the meal. It's a good thing if you want to get some food and you're dying for it or whatever, go to the Jewel or something, whatever. That's okay. <laughs> but we want you to hang out. So I want to encourage you to hang out here. We'd love to get to know you more. For those of you who raised your hands, please see me after service. I'd love to talk to you about what that decision means of following. Uh, but let me pray for you, and then we'll dismiss everybody. We don't want a big exodus out of here right now. So let me pray. We just want to give those guys time to get over there, get changed and everything, and ready for the baptism. God, we thank you so much for what you've done in this service for what you've done in the lives of these who are getting baptized. God, I pray right now that as we celebrate those who have made that decision and are taking this step of obedience, showing that they're following you by getting baptized. God, I pray the same things you prayed over them, Jesus. Protection, unity, God, and perseverance. God, we pray that we would come around them, that we would encourage them. God, we thank you for all that you're doing, God, for what you've revealed here. God, we pray that you would...
Bless the food as we're going to take it after the baptism, God. Bless the time that we have together. I pray that we'd be encouraged to hang out, God, to get to know somebody new. Because God, you haven't called us to be people who just come together and watch a sermon. God, you've called us to be family. God, to get to know one another, to bear one another's burdens, to help out one another, to pray for one another. So God, I pray that we would take this advantage of this opportunity to get to know each other better. Thank you for all that you're doing in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. If you are a first-time guest, if you could do me a huge favor, fill out a contact, uh, uh, contact card that's around the back of the chairs. You drop it off in the give boxes on the back as you exit. Again, if you did raise your hand, please see me afterwards. I'd love to talk to you about that decision. But fill out those cards, and we'll see you next door in just a little bit. We're going to be right outside the store, literally right out here where I'm looking out this window that you guys can't see, but literally right there. So go ahead and head on over.